Hi, my name is Ashley Trujillo, and I'll be reading Baby Emma on page 9. Emma's in an, in an island lost but happy because she knows she will get out of there soon. Her parents and the rest of the family are excited to see her and just give her love. Emma knows we are waiting for her with excitement. All she sees at the moment is water and trails. If she follows the trail, it will lead her to the boats. Then she will be out in a few months. Emma's, in, Emma's excited to meet the rest of the world and see her loved ones, but she is also scared that it will take her a couple of months to gather, get out of the ocean. Con el cuidado de Dios todo saldrá bien, she says to herself. She is looking forward to this new journey that is coming up. She is not alone. All her family has her in the prayers to keep her safe and help her find a way to come out of the island. Emma Luna is on her way. Months have passed and she's finally home with her parents. The family is blessed to have a wonderful little girl by their side. Her abuelos, tias, tios, primos y sobrinos just want to carry her around like a little dog. My name is Dwayne Smith. Uh, I'll be reading a small poem uh, on page four called, Have You Ever Felt Something Inside? Have you ever felt like something is inside you, crawling at the walls inside and you're afraid to let it out because it might do something that you will regret in the future? Well, that's kind of how my life is. But at certain points in time, it tends to show a fragment of itself. And just that peace can do big things to you. Sometimes I wish it would just die and leave me alone. At points in my life, it leaves for a short time. When it comes back, it's harder to contain but trying to contain something that can that can be held back is better than not containing it. But someday I know it'll break out and hurt the people I care about. Hello, my name is Gabriel Holland, and I'll be leave, um, reading. It starts at this table on page 57. The world starts at this writing table, and no matter what gets in our way, we must keep writing on. The ink and that were gifted to us, and we're set on this table so we can achieve great works of art. We brush away the erasure sheds and backspace all the writing errors, and we are ready for mistakes. Here it shows us how to be a better writer and later on in life make masterpieces. At this table we discuss poem topics, the people, the setting, and the dialogue in our stories. Our imaginations drink and express all with us while they write with us while they write with us and watch us screw up and get back on our feet again. This table has been the shed for the rain and the sunblock for the sun. Pencils were thrown at this table, ink covering, covering people's hands, and many of us celebrate our accomplishments. We have very trash writings and given birth to even better ones. So hopefully the world will end on this writing table while we continue writing our final words of wisdom, wisdom and give thanks. My name is and I will be sharing with you two pieces that I wrote here in class. Uh, I don't have the page number, but the first one is entitled The Gift of Hay. And again, this was a prompt that I was given in class, and I kind of just decided to be creative with it. He arrived to me on the last day of summer school. I had seen him before on, this, on display for everyone to see, walking around campus as if he owned the place. I believe that was the first thing that caught my attention. That or him never seeming to have a shirt on. Everything happened so fast on that last day of summer school. I was walking to class, walking with purpose, knowing if I walked any slower, I'd be late. Something, something on my left caught my eye. I turned my head in that direction, locked eyes with him, his eyes locked with mine. Everything seemed to be going in slow motion, like in those corny scenes in those corny romance movies. So, so corny, but that's what happened. I'm walking straight ahead, he's walking my way, yet neither of us are going anywhere. And before I could process all that happened, all that had happened, I'm in front of my classroom door. My head turns forward, my hand reaches for the knob, a feeling of regret overwhelms me. Did I imagine the moment? Was there even a moment to begin with? I tell myself I'm stupid, that I shouldn't have watched the fault in our stars night before. I'm not Hazel, he's not Gus, this wasn't one of those moments. 
But as soon as I turn the doorknob, telling myself to go inside before I embarrass myself even more, I hear, hey, to be continued. <laughs> he was inspired to me when we um, went to the craft museum for a field trip, and I had seen this picture, and it was in a hallway that had mostly all like African-American type art, and I had seen this one photo of a girl sitting in front of the fireplace and it inspired me to write this. She's left. Lost in thought. Oh, it's called the Harlem Gal, if you want to read a lot. She's left, lost in thought, not knowing where she'll end up next. She's naked, exposed, but feels secure in the wrapping of her own arms. In front of the fireplace, she's mesmerized, hypnotized, not having the ability to look away from the dull cherry flames. She's stuck. She gives up, allowing the flood of memories to play like a movie in her mind until the fire burns out. She falls into a deep sleep. The closing credits play, and she listens to the theme song of her inhales and exhales, awaiting the trailer of what her next day entails. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Perez, and I'll be reading The Kids Are Proud on page 20. This is for the kids, not just the kids, those kids, the ones who still haven't quite made sense of what they feel, the ones who know but don't say anything, the ones who know and do say something. This is for the kids, for the ones who are struggling to know themselves, for the ones who are in the dark, for the ones who are stuck, for the ones who are in the closet, as some would say, for the ones who just want to live without it being a big deal. This is for the kids, for the gay kids, the lesbian kids, the trans kids, the ones who are in between, and for the ones who aren't anything, for the ones who flow and for the ones who don't. This is for the kids, for the ones who are questioning, for the ones who are scared, for the ones who are out, for the ones no longer here, for the ones who held on and powered through. This is for the kids because no matter what, we are proud. I, my name is Daniel Wasiewicz Sernyogo and I will be reading Dirtying Jocks in Juxtaposition. I was going to read another one, but it was deemed it. I'm finished. Page 34. Jeff, J Jeff, Jason, and Jewelry are jocks journeying joyfully abroad. Off on a road, off handily, where obstacles obscure obstinately afar. Following a funny fork by the fainting funny fool, not knowing now that light lays low and cool, seeing dead in the dreadful dark, not deciding deliberate death card. Jason and Jewelry now wander wily in the forest with branches barred, but the woods wary woefully for silencing seconds stop. With beautiful birds in the burgundy branches singing their chorus, with the quivering quirk, with the giving a quivering qual, quail, doing the scary for us. Jewelry catching up with the kicking kidney, far from his thoughts, thinking something accomplished. Jonathan, Jordan, and Jackie are jocks journeying joyfully abroad, off on a road offhandedly where obs obstacles obscure obstinately afar. <laughs> Hi, my name is David, and I'm going to be reading uh, a poem that I wrote called Stone Cold. Darkness fills the winter's night sky as a man lays in the field frozen over from snow, so cold gripping his hands to never let go, without a place to call his own. He lays in the town he used to call home, stone cold. In this life he holds, hoping one day he can just let go as he lays in the field of fallen snow. Near boundaries he used to call his home, off the broken path he rolls into the stone pavement he goes. Some day as he could just let go and leave this life he used to hold. Deeply, co deeply dug caverns carved into his soul, painful memories he used to hold. Hi, my name is Desiree Lerma Collins, and I will be reading I, Desiree. I was born on September 17th to a mother and a not so their father. I am a sister as well as a mom to my sisters. I am still learning by myself, so I'll tell you what I do know. I was born to bring happiness. I like to help people, even if I try not to. I have been told that I have an addictive personality. I have a fascination with pianos, guitars, and all music in general. 
I tend to be second into doing things for people. I'm scared of losing everyone and everything, as well as heights and roller coasters with, and roller coasters with nothing to hold on to. I've never done a lot of stuff. I wonder what would happen if it all stopped right now. I'm afraid of oblivion and the unknown. Hi, my name is Desiree. I enjoy music and life, although they are the same thing. My hobbies include momming, reading, procrastinating, and playing the guitar. I don't know much, but I do know this. I'll never finish writing. My name is Lucia, and I'll be reading You Understand, or I'm reading two. Uh, you Understand When You're Older is the first one. Have you ever heard your mom say you understand when you're older? That's probably because she didn't want to explain herself, and everyone knows not to question mom. Even when mom and dad are arguing, dad usually shuts up and says, you're right, because he knows a happy wife means a happy life. When you're older, siblings grow up, and you ask them, how did you survive? They usually say, just listen, mom knows best. Or when you notice mom's best friend is MIA and you ask why, she says, I'll tell you when you're older. Have you ever done something because someone else did it, then your dad asks why, two wrongs don't make it right? Or have you ever gotten hurt fighting with your siblings, then when you go to tell all your parents say is suck it up? Well, it's all for a reason, and now that you're older, do you understand? <laughs> And the second one is on page 49. It says, this is for the mothers. This is for the mothers who wake up before the sun just to work till the moon is shining. We appreciate you. This is for the moms who stay at home to take care of their kids and drive 24 seven to doctors, schools, sports, and so forth. You're appreciated. This is for the mamas who chase after their dreams, no matter what, to show their kids that anything is possible. You are special. To the Madres who work their butts off to give their kids all that they want, we love you. This is for our supporters, our moms. You mean the world to us, and we only hope to make you proud. Okay. Um, give me a second. <laughs> um, my name is Emily Johnson, and I'm reading the, um, the, the poem called Gifts on page 52. The present is a gift. The present is everything. You have to live as if you won't wake up tomorrow. You have to live as if you find your epic love. You have to see things not as they are, but what they could be. As my therapist once told me, you have to see you cannot control everything, but you can't control how you let things affect you, how you deal with things, because you are in control of you. You can be whatever you want. You can live your life because it is your life and you decide whether you hide from it or whether you run toward it so don't be afraid be happy you have now to change you have today to be as you want to be you have the present the present isn't something to take harshly it is something to enjoy because it is your present it is your gift Feelings on page 53, I guess. Um, the ones that take over when you told yourself they wouldn't. The ones that make you want to die and wish you didn't feel at all. The ones that make you fall too deep. And the ones and make it impossible to crawl back out. The ones that force you to pretend you are fine. The ones that keep you awake even when you know you should sleep. The ones that cause the bad dreams and when make you doubt make you doubt when you sh should keep going. Well, those aren't the only feelings. There are ones that lift you up, even when you are down. The ones that make good dreams. The hope, the happy, silly, and awkward feelings. The ones that make you smile for no reason. The ones that make you think, well, he might like me back. The ones that leave a fire burning inside. Those are the ones that help me live. Okay, um, I'm... My name is Jada. Um, I will be reading Tears on page 60, and because it's pretty long, I'll just be reading the first page. The eerie darkness of that night would never escape my memory. I clearly remember the pitch black curtain draped over the sky and the twisted warped shapes that the stars made against the blackness. The milky speckles twirled and danced along the sky in various patterns, tugging at the corners of my lips in a way that almost made me smile. 
It was hard to shove aside the worries corrupting my mind, but eventually I stopped walking over the soft sand below my feet and just stopped, <laughs> and just stopped thinking. I was alone. Nothing from my life could touch me. Not a single thing could harm me. I stood up at the sky and studied the silver glow of the moon. It smiled down at me with love so intense it warmed my soul like a fireplace on a cold winter night. And there I was, standing on the shore at midnight to escape my life at home. Not wanting to do anything but cry. The look of peace the moon reflected toward me ceased the storm tussling inside my soul. Now instead, a hot orange fire flickered in my heart and soon started, and soon started to grow, eating at all the dark emotions in its path. My worries burned away, and the tears that were starting to form at the corners of my eyes melted down my face with a rush of frigid relief. Crying felt good, especially when they were tears that I didn't want to push away. They weren't drops of sadness. No, they were more like the feeling of joy, relief, happiness, and freedom streaming away from my hurt eyes. They were temporary cleansers to wash away the pain. I tried my best never to cry in front of others. It made me look weak, feel weak. But that night, under the watchful eyes of millions of stars and the beautiful moon, I felt that I could let the floodgates open with a single flutter of my eyelids. I stared up at the sky and continued to let my pain run away for the moment. The cold midnight waves rolled in and tickled my feet as I stood on the beach, not ever wanting to leave, not ever wanting to face reality, not ever wanting to accept that life isn't a book of fairy tales and the magic is in Hi, my name is Carissa Zaldivar, and I'll be reading my piece called Women of Color on page 75. Here you go. She was not hard, but she would not claim gentleness as it may have claimed her. She was not electric or shocking, but she would not go unnoticed. She would move you like glaciers, achingly slow, but the time would never occur to you. She would settle over you like a mist on still water. Rarely would you notice her until you were already enveloped in her grace. Hermosa. Blatantly soft, you could not help the urge to reach out and touch her. Sweet and pretty, she was almost too perfect. You might barely catch a glimpse of her trail of light as she rarely slowed to a stop. Nothing and no one could move with such obvious beauty. Maybe you want her. Maybe she is too sweet for your taste. But all will be too caught in her flurry to realize the bravery, the gentle history, its fuzzy presence hanging to the wind in her hair or the rounded curve of her lip. Amor. She burbles at the creek bed waiting for nothing. Her sound is unheard or sung only to the curious who creep low to the earth. You need not seek her out. She is already with you. You already love her. She rests there in the heaviest parts of your heart. She gives company to the regrets, making sure they are never lonely. She tends to your dreams at night, collecting the colors that grow there. There will come a day when you rest beside her in silence. Remember to thank her for holding your heart with both hands. My name is Kazai Foster, and I will be reading you my poem, This is for the Guy Friends, on page 82 through 83, because it's two pages. This is for the guy friends, the ill, he's not my boyfriend friends. The guy friends who buy you snacks and rub your back. The guy friends who ad lib to your fave book and make it awkwardly R-rated. The guy friends who steal your pencils. This is for the guy friends. This is for the one who knocks you out of your chair so you slap him, but you're still cool guy friends. The guy friends who ship you with the weirdest of people who know you only eat tuna sandwiches if the tuna has mayo. This is for the guy friends. This is for the guy friends who hope to become more than friends. This is for the guy friends who hold girls' hands even though they're sweaty. Really sweaty. This is for the guy friends who get called daddy, brother, and sometimes the B word. The ones girls consider their brother and best friend. This is for the guy friends. Gay, straight, young, and old. Black, white, poly, and everything in between, the guy friend, not quite boyfriend, the make you laugh till you fall out of your chair guy friend. The one who got elbowed in the gut for sneaking up on you guy friend, this is for the guy friends. Who grow up into men, always have your back in the end, who know all your favorite musicians and songs, this is for the guy friends. Because you're already more than just a friend, because you're brothers, because you're lovers, because you are special and one of a kind, because we girls cannot live without you. You are counselors offering advice from a new perspective. This is for the guy friends, they make us laugh, Hold us more sad, lift us more down, cool us down more mad. This is for the guy friends because they are our world. <laughs> Accurate, okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kiki and I'll be reading a piece called Sunflowers, A Letter to Little Me on page 93. Okay. Take your hand and place it over your chest, favoring the left side. Do you feel that? That's your heart. And when I was little, I was told that this is what you feel love with. And though what I was told was partially right, I was denied the simple pleasures of knowing what else love entails. Everywhere else that you feel it. I won't deny you that pleasure. 
Take the hand that is on your heart and move it to your cheeks, atop the apples. You're going to feel so much here. It might even hurt from using them too much, but it's a good hurt. Your cheeks will flush red and your smile will be the whitest it's ever been when, you, when you're with someone that you love. And you'll never get tired of it. You feel love here. Move your hand from your cheeks up to your eyes, but don't poke them. These help your heart grow even fonder of the one that you love. Your eyes will always want to be on that person when you're with them, watching them glow when talking about things that excite them, analyzing every detail about them and loving them even more. You just can't help it, and you'll never want to look away. You feel love here. Go from your eyes to your ears, but don't plug them. Ears are important. You have to listen to them when you love, when they need it or even when they don't. Your ears are always open for them, and you can listen to simply their voice for hours and never get bored. Trust me. You feel love here. Wander from your ears to your mouth and smile. Communication. It's healthy and necessary and you feel so much better. Talk with your partner. Talk to your partner. Discuss important things, healthy things, problems you have, your feelings, their feelings. And tell them you love them. Never let them go unappreciated. You feel love here. Now jump from your mouth down to your stomach and feel the knots. Here's where the butterflies sleep. If you're not careful, you can wake them, and they'll go crazy. It feels like daisies are exploding everywhere, and when you're with someone you love, they'll always be crazy. But it's crazy in the best way, so you won't mind them too much. You feel love here. Lastly, move your hand from your stomach to your fingertips and down to your toes. I bet you're wondering why, but this answer is the simplest. When you're with someone you love, you feel it not just in your heart, but everywhere, even in your fingers and toes. You're filled with warmth and joy, and you melt like butter when they're around. They make you feel safe and secure and giggly all the time. It feels like sunflowers and roses are growing in your veins, like rays of sunshine and honey are inside of you. It's hard to explain love to someone because it's something you have to feel, but once you feel it with the right person, you want to feel it forever. <laughs> My name is Lene Gomez Menor, and I will be reading a piece called A True Present. It's on page 98 to 99. <laughs> My gift wasn't something you could touch. It was strenuous hours of dancing, replacing homework for my celebration. It was hard. It was listening to the same song about a thousand times and crafting matching choreography with them too. It was bratty attitudes and talking back, the prepaid package deal that comes with all teenagers. It was arguments, anxiety, stress, the prepaid package deal that comes with me. It was spending $100 too much on feeding 13 young hungry souls. It was spending $1,900 on a gift you could not feel. 1900 too much. 1900 not counting everything extra. 1900 I could not believe was being spent on me. My gift was thrust in my hand like a grandma trying to secretly give you $5. Except instead of $5, it was 1900 and instead of a secret of giving, it was extravagant. Not being worthy enough to have a full day dedicated to my existence that cost over $1,900, and not being able to accept $5 from an elderly family member, both gave me the same tummy ache. I was not worthy, be it 1900 or 5 I was not worthy. Or at least that's what I thought, until the day of. The day was wrapped in as much stress as I thought it would be. From migraines, blisters, and music malfunctions, I still enjoyed myself. From crying in the hallway, wearing eyeliner, and the wrong shoes, I still enjoyed myself. From too big of a crowd for the small hall to too small of an audience for my big heart, I still enjoyed myself. My birthday gift was not the extravagant party or big cake. It was the loyalty of my family and friends. Friends, it was spending money, time, and sweat on a celebration that your own culture did not understand. Nana, it was beating my dress when arthritis constantly attacked your once elegant hands, late nights after work and early mornings. Grandma, it was buying new jewelry, even though you already had used substitutes. Auntie, it was countless, countless hours of hot glue guns, ribbons, marbles, countless hours of flour, sugar, and everything else. You had not known me well, for we are not related by what is in our veins, but what is in our hearts. You are one of the most loyal. Grandma's, it was slaving over a stove in your wheelchairs. Although I do not know how you two did it, I am grateful. Mom, it was birthing me, feeding me, caring for me. I love you. It was spending money that we do not have on a party that I did not need. I love you. Mom, your loyalty and care was the best gift I never asked for. Thank you, everybody. My present was not the one wrapped in tissue paper, but wrapped in the warmth of your ever-caring souls. 
So as cheesy as it sounds, what's your present? What's your presence? <laughs> All right. Good evening. My name is Maya Langford, and I'll be reading If Only You Can Remember So You Would Know on page 106 through 107. Some people say that there is no such thing as God. Some say that we are nothing in the grand scheme and that we are pinhead dots in a vast universe. Some say that you only live once. Some say people can't change and that we will never be able to achieve perfection. Some say we are completely and utterly on our own in this life, and when the time comes, we are lost and forgotten to a whole one little planet. But if only you knew. Don't you remember where we came from? A place of light, peace, happiness, hope, and love? Don't you remember your brother and sisters? If only you can press rewind and go all the way back to before life on Earth and see you and me and him and her. Don't you remember the plan? Don't you remember fighting to stay together, fighting to come here, fighting to be where you and I stand today? Don't you? Don't tell me you've forgotten the one third that we couldn't save, the family that we lost to the other side. Don't you remember the tears we shared, the good and the bad? Don't you remember saying to each other that we made a choice and that we chose right? Don't you remember? We, wa we watched our family leave one by one to go to Earth until it was finally our turn. We hugged each other and Ryan said, I will find you down there and promised we would stay strong to keep fighting for each other and remember light and peace and happiness and hope and love. So yes, some say there is no such thing as divine beings, but we are sons and daughters. So yes, some say we are nothing, but we are everything. This is a stop in our long journey. Hard, yes, but necessary. We chose it, and it's a stop that will change and mold us into perfection. Some people, some say people can't change, but we are capable of turning our lives around for the better. Some say we are alone, but we are never alone, never. We are neither lost nor forgotten. Remember? Don't you remember this? Because then you would know. Hi, my name is Marette Oxner. Um, and I think I'm just going to read one. I'll read two. Um, I'm going to start with eulogy on page 121. If I die too quickly, write me a eulogy that people will be jealous of. Call me a renaissance woman and brag about my accomplishments until even my cold corpse is blushing. Tell them about my poetry. Articulate at length about my most becoming faults. Make sure I had a bohemian life, short, poor, and passionate. Tell them it was tuberculosis that stole me away. Even if it wasn't, let me go down in history alongside Emerson and Poe. Bury me on home soil, lay me to rest in the catacombs of an art museum, pra place my gravestone on the ocean floor. Tell everyone I was distressingly humble and distractingly beautiful. Remember, once people are dead, nobody cares what's true. Wow. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to read tonight on page 142 because I haven't read this to my family yet my family is in the kitchen bubbling like teapots around the dining table they're full of electricity and life and so am I my oldest sister is so good at being alive her brain is like a city grid lighting up neurons that are miles away from each other she takes off before she's even landed he is a tree looming above her, complete with the wind in his branches. He catches hold of a joke, then a comment, lastly a word, somehow taller than he is. Dad is a kid along with us. Crayon in hand, he smiles through wise eyes, a soft tap on my shoulder in passing. Mom makes contradictions look planned. She is a 10,000-piece jigsaw with most of them in place. When she shifts, her leather chair creaks, happy to have its story intertwined with hers. The other two walk lightly. You'd never guess they carried two hearts in their chests. If you look close, you'd see the thread, stretching eastward, tangling around the chairs and walls. For now, they are here and happy. Soon, they will trace their way by, back. This is our way of life, and the yellow room soaks us in. 
Tonight, it basks in our glow. Thank you. Hello, my name is Natalie King, and I will be reading uh, Constellation on page 130. I am honey crisp apples, rose quartz, calcite, shimmering golden well water, ethereal and glowing and not quite of this world, but also crumbs on the couch, the mundanity of a daily routine, the frustrating ordinariness of living in a world where only true magic lies in music and rose-colored clouds and the rainbows that peak from sprinkler streams. I am the delicate balance that lies between comfort and risk. I am a coloring page, promising I will go outside the land this time, only to retreat back to the safety of order and easy roots and hiding inside the black and white. I am the perplexing contradiction of going, growing up too fast, yet staying stuck in childhood. I am the knowledge that the world sets impossible expectations for us, of knowing it is a lie, but still feeling inadequate for not living up to it. I am at my strongest at night, my best self, like a werewolf draining power from the moon, the soft, radiant moon who does her best to give me a friend in the night sky. I am the joy of getting first pick of what to wear the day after laundry, the gold chain of a jeweled necklace, held together by tension and stability simultaneously. I am a hermit crab learning to shed the shell and bite the bullet, the worn-in, comfortable seats of an old movie theater, a pride flag surrounded by swirling, billowing colors that envelop me like a toga ruling the Greek council in my vibrant ensemble, a vision of mercy and might. I am forgiveness, a bear hug that lasts just a little too long, the last breath before the curtain call, the deep yearning and elation that spins into your heart after hearing your favorite song for the first time. I am a constellation that hasn't been named yet. Hi, my name is Rhiannon Stewart, and I'll be reading two, po two pieces. Um, the first one is on page 143, and it's called Swarm of Bees. Swarming bees, buzzing, flying, they fly close, but don't sting. No matter where they, where, where I go, they move toward May, who smells of Ch Chanel number no. five. They collect the smell, thinking it is a flower, but are wrong. The next one is on... The next one is on page 144, and it's called Shiny Happy People. Shut up. You're so intelligent and mature for your age. Wait, you did something intelligent and mature? You're not that intelligent or mature. Maybe you'll understand when you've had a few more years under your belt. You deserve, um, oh darling, you're a sinner. These are the things people have said to me, whether it's been by family or friends of family. I'm not supposed to stand up and say, wait a minute, that's wrong and rude. I'm supposed to sit down and be quiet. I'm supposed to be demure, and I'm supposed to take it like a man. I'm supposed to grin and bear it, fake it till you make it. Don't say no. Don't cry in public, because if you do, you are weak. Don't interrupt people. Well, how am I supposed to grin and bear it when you say nothing but hurtful words? How am I supposed to take it like a man if, not, if I'm not even a man? I can't even interrupt someone when I'm having an anxiety attack, because if I do, I'm being a jerk, and something bad might happen, which adds on to the anxiety. Listen to me. Take me seriously. No more judgments. Take no as an answer. Hello. Um, I am Riley Van Morris, and I am going to be reading an excerpt from my story to sell on page 150. <laughs> it's been three weeks since I was locked in this cell. They've given me neither food nor water, and the bucket they gave me has long since been filled. I've been living off the flesh and blood of the rats crawling over my legs, and I've used their bones as toothpicks. I'm not a horrible person, yet somehow I've managed to gain the negative attention of the king. I know not what I've done wrong, nor do I know the sentencing. I suspect foul plot in this play. I, yeah, I suspect foul play in this plot against me, but I will likely never know. As the rats run out and the days seem longer, I fear my time on this earth grows short. Yet again, I do not know what these men plan to do with me, but I'm afraid I'll end up dead no matter what happens now. The grime from these stone walls has seeped into my skin and I no longer feel like a human being. My clothes have been ripped to shreds and the rats have carved a hole in my side, though it's been days since I last saw a rat. I've tried to escape several times now, clawing my fingers raw on stone walls, beating my fists bloody on the door, even going so far as to attempt to attack guard. Though I didn't follow through with the last one, 
My skin peels off layers at a time as the boils on my neck grow worse from the grit. My shackles are loose on my wrist due to starvation. And that's all I'm going to read. Um, <laughs> Follow me. I often wonder why. I sometimes forget to look up at the sky. My teacher always told me to remember my ABCs, except for the days I have scraped my little nose. My peers used to tell me that I was just being lazy, instead of asking how I was feeling lately. I would cry in my sleep every day and night, and sometimes even wonder the meaning of being alive. I always tried to remember my ABCs, but I'd often forget what comes after E. I should look at the sky more instead of often wonder why my brain doesn't work like others. Thank you. Now I will be reading a TMA treasure poem on page 173. <clears throat> if only I was born in the right body. If only I have to pay a thousand plus dollars to have the body I was meant to be in. If only I had a deeper voice and a flatter chest. If only I didn't have to. If only I were able to walk around shirtless without getting weird looks or in trouble. If only I didn't have to lose friends and family over my gender or sexuality. If only this can't change what's already happened, but I will as well change happening in the future. I will have a flat chest. I will have a deeper voice. I will have enough money to start hormones and get the surgeries I want. I will lose people, but maybe people will come. And I will soon have the body I was meant to be in the little TikTok. Hello, my name is... Hello, my name is Whitney Morning Owl, and I. <laughs> my poem is on page 180, and it's Grace Guys. Her honey glazed lips and cherry picked eyes stained my cheeks until I felt my lips glaze over. I could only scream. Her song chilled voice and diamond jewel pupils frightened me as I tried to grasp her reality into mine. I could only brush them into one another before sighing from the wrenching pain. I could only scream. Her feather hair and snow dew eyes soon washed over me with the years of growth and left me defenseless. Her years, one, only years later when we exchanged letters, I ended up finding her sun-kissed lips turned into lavender jawbones and pictorial flat landscapes. And she was no longer the dandelion dream, but the ruby rose red liquid teardrops that wanted to be known as the he that everyone around him knew him as, but me. I could only smile. He was soon full of clouds and cherry blossoms that illuminated the sky and left me helpless. I had fallen for the her, and as the he came out and blossomed, I fell even more in love with the happiness and joy he brought out in her. Only, now I only smile for the her that should have died. Tonight I'll be reading Living in a Dream World on page 136. Funny people who live in volcanoes carry true romance. On the shoreline where good vibes grow with the waves, they crash at the doorstep at the house of the rising sun. Born to run, running on empty, gone with the wind, on the edge of tomorrow, it's some kind of wonderful. Woo! And um, I'm going to read a piece, um, I'm going to read a couple pieces, one from myself, and another one from Dorothy, who is the other volunteer um, who writes with us every Friday, and she's so good. Um, and the two pieces I'm going to read are really indicative of some of the, um, some of the things that we do in class. Um, the first one that I'm going to read, called Color Sample, is based on an activity where Hillary and Kristen will bring in all of these paint chips, like, like the things you get at the paint store, and they're all these weird colors with, with names on them, kind of like you would see at the lipstick counter. Um, so, Color Sample. I chose the sage green because it called to me with its natural hue, a little mossy and foresty, and it made me think of the Santa Cruz Mountains, where we might wear gray plaid flannel shirts shot with this muted green over our dingy thermal Henleys, with old Levi's and ankle boots so broken in that no one needed to pack moleskin. Is it Girl Scout camp that comes to mind? Skylark Ranch, where I went each summer, where manzanita shrubs slightly darker than this lined the roads as we trudged toward the Poison Oak Edge Trail that forced us into a line, our chatter challenged by single file formation. 
The sunlight dappled on the forest floor, rusty pine needles nourishing dirt that gave rise to towering redwood giants with trucks, trunks larger than we could hold, our hands, hold hands around. Riots of clover, mossy rocks, our flannel sleeves unrolled, arms ch hugging chilled bones. But the sun's up there, way up there, and there's a scent like artichokes, like the sage green color I chose. I flipped the color card to see its name, expecting something creatively sage or artichokey, maybe something about frogs, nature, or ponds between, be, beneath weeping trees. It's called Fashion Week. <laughs> And this piece that I'm going to read is from Dorothy Rice, and um, it's based on a prompt that we write to, I think every semester, um, about sayings that your parents may have said, and um, so she has written a poem. Don't toot your own horn, that's what my father always said. Not that I had a horn or was prone to tooting. Don't <laughs> stick your neck out or draw attention to yourself. Don't gum up the works or become the squeaky wheel. Why the need to knock me down a peg? Was my head too big for my shoulders? My eyes bigger than my stomach? Was I growing altogether too big for my britches? What are britches anyway? I mean, I know, I could guess, but who says these things? <coughs> Platitudes, cliches, hackneyed old phrases that have become shorthand, that roll off the tongue, that mean something and nothing at all. What did you want from me, Dad, with the advice to keep my head down, to, to soldier on, to put in my time and fight the good fight, to never leave a penny in the street, and not to speak unless I had something nice to say, that I should suck it up, that this too will pass, that good things come to she who waits, that silence is golden and the tortoise wins the race, except when the early bird gets the worm and the squeaky wheel the grease, and there is no rest for the wicked, the wicked girl. Because I dreamed too big, swam too deep, got in over my head. I grew tired of waiting for ships that never came in and for a handsome prince to kiss my warty cheek, for my sow's ear to be transformed into a silk purse. I chose to seize the day, to fire the first shot across the bow and to raise my flag high and yes, to find a horn to toot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, this poem was inspired by a spoken word uh, poet, Rudy Francisco, who wrote an honest poem. And my poem is called, To Tell You the Truth. I was born in the summer of 1969, the year of Woodstock, the first man on the moon, the Manson murders, the start of the draft of the Vietnam War. My dad was 20. My mom must have dreaded the mail. I came into the world under the dry heat of the California sun. My friends loved to swim in the lake by my house but I always preferred the sprinklers on the lawn. Less scary. Everyone told me lakes don't have sharks, and I knew it, but I didn't feel it. <laughs> I still enjoy the warm sun on a cool day because it quiets down the waves in my head. It gets loud in there sometimes. I am often in the throes of a riptide of feelings that sweeps me out to sea where I have to swim, swim, swim to find a way back to the shore where the sand is hard but solid. Sometimes it takes a long time to get there. My tongue only knows the side stroke. I'm often somewhere besides here, like during that long meeting I'm probably in Hogwarts memorizing spells, or during a boring class I'm in Verona, wishing Romeo would show up. Or when the TV show gets redundant, I'm in Manhattan holding hands with Holden and wearing his orange hunting hat. I enjoy, the, I enjoy a bowl of coffee ice cream, as long as no one is watching, books that have brilliant sentences and little kids who don't know about the bad things in life yet. I don't allow myself to eat the strawberries in the refrigerator. I save them for everyone else. I wake up early, even when I don't want to. Yesterday I forded, folded four loads of laundry, went grocery shopping, made everyone dinner, and vacuumed dog hair. I'll probably do it again today and tomorrow. I'm the shortest person in my family with the biggest feelings. Those feelings are taller than I am and they annoy everybody. Even the dog sometimes skitters around the corner when I come into the room, unless I'm holding a hot dog, which is almost never because, you know, the dog hair. <laughs> I have a fascination with Sherpa blankets, perfectly mowed lawns, clean counters, and Hugh Jackman. <laughs> I wonder how deep the oceans will be by the time I have great-grandchildren. I'll probably need to buy them rain boots. 
Maybe in the year they were born, they are born, there will be a woman on the moon. I prefer jogging to swimming because it involves a lot less water in the ears and up the nose and gasping for breath and sinking. Jogging is just me and the road. And yes, I know that wasn't grammatically correct. It kind of hurt to type it that way, but it felt important. I'm afraid of tidal waves and tsunamis because I know what they feel like. I've never jumped off a high dive. I probably won't, but I think about it. <laughs> I have more of a talent for recognizing talent than having my own. At, that, at least that's the excuse I make for not trying. My hobbies include pretending I can play the piano, looking through the windows, in or out, and lying under a tree imagining the falling leaves are snow. Hi, my name is Hillary, and I'm still learning how to say things out loud, out loud like, that girl hurt me, or I'm afraid of the ocean, or hey, could you do a load of laundry? I don't know much, but I do know this. It's important to know how to swim. I do know that I love my family, and that love is a life raft life raft against all the raging storms that seem to come in every season, every five minutes actually. To be honest, being a mom has been my best life jacket, but I'm still afraid of sharks. Okay. So uh, just to give parents and visitors a glimpse of some of the stuff we do uh, in our classes, we have a series of the prompts we do uh, and work on fiction writing. And three weeks in a row, we basically just give the students pictures and say, here you go, write for half an hour, have at it. Um, so one week we do pictures of people, one week is pictures of settings, and then we bring out the pictures of the doors. Um, and so that's all the students get. They get a picture of a door and they get a key. And we say, there you go. So if you can imagine, you know, they, they've been in the class for a while and, and they write furiously for, you know, half an hour, uh, just a picture of a door. So um, we throw things at them and never know what they're going to come up with. So this is mine that I wrote about the door this time, and it's called The Gray Door, page 214. Alice walked by the house every day on her way to work. It was the routine, pick up a small coffee, black, one sugar, and sip it as she passed her favorite house on her favorite street in London. She had never seen anyone emerge from the gray door, and so she was free to imagine who lived inside. Sometimes it was Mr. and Mrs. Dorset who had lived there for 50 years, first raising their children and now having their grandchildren over to bake biscuits, play board games, or spend the weekend Sometimes it was Peter and Leslie with their new baby Charlie trying to fit their state-of-the-art pram through the front door as they set out for a walk on a warm Saturday afternoon. Sometimes it was Ryan, a handsome doctor, just about Alice's age who had purchased the house with the hopes of soon settling down now that his residency was complete and he had established his practice. This morning, as Alice paused in front of the house, she tilted her head, wondering who was inside today. She could simply knock, she told herself as she sipped her coffee. She could make up an excuse about a missing dog or tell them that she had the wrong house when they opened the door and she was so sorry to have disturbed. Just a glimpse inside, just a visual confirmation of who lived there. She would do it, she decided. She would be brave and assertive. She would go with the missing dog, maybe a tiny Yorkie named Teacup. She smoothed her hair and marched up the steps. Just as Alice raised her fist to knock, she heard something fall and shatter inside. She lowered her arm and took a step back. Well, now clearly was not the appropriate time. She could always try again tomorrow. Yes, that's what she would do tomorrow. Knock. Tomorrow. Answers. As she was about to leave, she heard the creak of the doorknob and the door open just a crack. Never in her life could she have imagined the person who peered at her from the other side. Not Mr. and Mrs. Dorset, not Peter and Leslie and Charlie, definitely not Dr. Ryan. Well, yes, this is just about right, the woman said. Alice found that she could not speak when she opened her mouth. Just a quiet squeak escaped her lips. Come inside then before anyone notices woman said as she ushered Alice through the doorway. 
Alice could only nod and do as she was told. How in the world could this be? How in the world could this be? The woman echoed Alice's thoughts. I remember that dress, she said, gesturing at the tailored navy wool. Don't worry, Alice. All will be explained in due time. The woman came to stand directly in front of Alice. Green eyes to green eyes. The same height of five foot four and three quarters. Hair now slightly dulled by silver, soft lines about her eyes and mouth. Yes, the woman said, I am you. Welcome home, dear. We have a lot of work to do.